I wasn't very um, sure that I was ready to be a full-time writer. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Unpack With Me, a show where we have wholesome and authentic conversations. And in today's episode, we have Casey Day Anosike, a writer, editor, and communications expert. And we're going to be unpacking career, creativity, and maintaining a work-life balance-ish. And I hope you enjoy watching. If you do, do not forget to give this video a big thumbs up, subscribe, and share. So, let's unpack. <laughs> Are you okay? I am. Do you want to like, why are you? Do you need a moment? No, 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 no. Do you need a moment? No, I'm fine. I'm let's, good. Let's unpack. Okay. Tell me. Let's unpack. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. I like that. Whew. Okay. So, the f I don't know if I should start with the framing of our conversation today because I just kind of like wanted to flow. Mm hmm Yeah. Do you want to give you a full disclosure that I have no idea what we're talking about? Yeah, of course. Like, you don't, like, you don't... <laughs> um... But I'm very curious mm -hmm. to understand, like, I feel like we talk about a lot of things, obviously, because we're siblings. Um, but I'm very curious to understand, like, how your mind works when it comes to navigating your creativity with what you currently do now as communications manager. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> Uh, did, you, did you see that coming? Um, I saw a variant of it coming. Mm. Um, how does my mind work? Okay, I'm going to simplify it by saying that um, when it comes to creativity, I like to think of myself as a storyteller. I like mm. telling stories. I think that stories are very powerful and they connect us and all of that. And when it comes to my work, it's also about storytelling. It's also identifying what the message, what the purpose of this organization is, mm -hmm. and how I can help to amplify that. Mm -hmm. So on some level, it's due to the same storytelling, but different tactics, different, I suppose, structures mm -hmm. of language. Uh, but I think at the core, it's just allowing someone to understand what is the message, what is the narrative behind this organization, yeah. versus what is the message of a story. So it's, it's, it's still very much at the, at the core of who I am, storytelling. Yeah. So yeah, talking about like speaking about the core of who you are, we okay, if people don't know, but we most of us know you as like a, we knew you as a writer first, right? I know you as a writer first. And now you've kind of like obviously what you're seeing is both jobs, being a writer editor and like obviously being communications manager and everything require you to requires you to tell like stories and stuff. But do you think that you would have gone through do you think, do you have any regrets not chasing the path of writing wholeheartedly as like a creative mm. and then, or venturing, okay, rather venturing into corporate communications? No, I don't, ha I don't have any regrets at all. I, I think that if I, if I went head on to, you know, try to be a writer, I think I'll be very frustrated. Why? Um, because <laughs> I think it, uh, there's a lot of systems around writing right there's the personal experience of okay what story do you want to tell and then there's also the function of how you're going to tell the story who's going yeah. to support you and blah 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 and writing is very political the stories that you choose to tell the platforms mm -hmm. that you choose to publish and for me i feel like at the point where i was maybe my mid-20s where i was trying to figure out am i going to pursue being a writer full time or am i going to explore you know other things I wasn't very um, sure that I was ready to be a full-time writer mm -hmm. because I think that I would be very frustrated. Yeah, yeah. but um, now obviously like, reflecting on it a couple of years from your decision to transition, do you feel like that might have been you killing a dream? Absolutely not. And I don't even think that I have transitioned. I think that people who... Of course, uh, everyone on social media is like, oh, we need a book from you. It's been a long time since you've written. And my first identity really is as a writer. So I don't think I've transitioned from being a writer to now being a non-writer. I don't think that's, that's Yeah, possible. no, no, no. But like, it's so different when you, obviously now you identify as a writer, editor, mm -hmm. communications manager. But still, when you check your CV or your resume, you're a communications manager. Do you get? So it's different if you're identifying as a full-on writer as opposed to someone who has kind of like maneuvered their way into corporate communications. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I see what you're saying. And I think for me, it's at the base level, it's still storytelling. Yeah. Right? I think it's just what am I paying my attention more mm -hmm. on. And I think for me, being a communications professional, there's also value in that as well. There's yeah, also value and merit in telling those kind of stories. And people will talk about, oh, you know, you work for the corporate, and you, there's capitalism and all of those things, which mm -hmm. are very true. But there's also the politics of publishing that is also very, very um, strong. I'll give you an example. For a, in Nigeria, we don't have, our reading culture is not very strong to start with. Mm -hmm. The ecosystems that are supposed to support the creative arts are also not quite strong. Um, you see some of the stories of some of the art writers that are, you know, well-maintained, well-established these days. They sort of had to get like foreign agents, you know, yeah. foreign editors. and a foreign, a foreign stamp you know, of approval. Exactly. And I've always... Loot is such a strong word, but just the politics of publishing. I remember when I was, I used to actively write a lot, and I'll send my 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 manuscripts or my draft, or send them to all of these, you know, the tier one publications, and it's just a long thing. Sometimes you have to wait for five months, and sometimes you have to wait for six months, and sometimes, you know, if you're fortunate enough that someone has picked up your writing, then the editing process is now so long, and they tend yeah. to start to edit it. It's losing the texture. It's losing the story. And I think for me, that's part of why I really, you know, took social media for what it was, because it was this place where I could express myself and my writing unprovoked, mm -hmm. you know, without the pressure of... You like you the know, shorts, like no Instagram posts, and then like just write stories. You know, like, exactly. So yeah. it was, and, and, and because stories have always mattered to me. Stories are, you know, the fabric of why we exist as humans. And it was very important for me to tell it regardless of what the structures around it are or where at that time. Yeah. So if to say, yes, I wanted to publish, so what would that look like? I'll have to now start writing. When I finish writing, I have to find a publisher or an editor or go for an MFA program in the US and hope an agent picks up my work. And it's all that is time yeah. that sometimes distracts from the work. And for me, the work has always been what matters. The what matters yeah. you know? Okay, I see that. So let's, let me talk to you about like routines. I know you wake up 4 a.m., 5 a.m. every day. You literally, you have to go to the gym at 5.30, 6 o'clock. How do you think, um, like, having, like, a morning routine has shaped who you are as a person right now? I think it's about discipline. I think any kind of success is foremostly about discipline. And I think that's what routine teaches me. Or it just sort of brings my attention to so that discipline. So yeah, I wake up four thirty in the morning. I, you know, I go to work out, and then I have coffee at a particular time, and I clock in at a particular time, and I do it. And there's a way in which it could seem a bit redundant uh -huh. because it's like you're doing the same thing all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if I step out of my of my routine, it's very distracting for me because then it means I have to consider other things in my life, which, um, if I don't, sort of the word make a routine out of mm. it i could suffer yeah what's the one thing that you look forward to the most in your days i think <laughs> closing my laptop at the end of every day but you don't you don't close your laptop at a certain time so aside that what's one thing that you look forward to every single day okay so what i do when i get to the or something that's the morning, joy. what i do when i get every day i i make a list of things i want to do uh -huh. and i spend like maybe 20 30 minutes uh -huh. just writing them down and then every time I do it during the course of the day, I go to tick it. Yeah. So if I have, if I miraculously tick all the things I need to do in one day, mm -hmm. it's very, uh, it's very rewarding. Okay, fine. So would you, um, you think you're successful? Would you like, would you call yourself a successful man in Nigeria, in Lagos, in your field of work right now? Uh, success is very relative. Mm. Um, but to answer your question, I do feel very. Fortunate. I feel very grateful for not just the work that I do, but to be able to do it in the way that I do it. And it's very important to me because I've never really liked to be one thing. I've never really liked to identify as just, you know, oh, I'm a writer, so therefore, you know, oh, I'm a this, so therefore. So I think to do, to live life in the way that I do, to be passionate about art in the way that I'm passionate about art, to be connected with telling stories and to also exist in a corporate world and also not lose the essence of who I am in terms of my expressions or, you know, what I find joy in. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I think those are the things I think qualify success to me. The the fact that my individuality is still you very visible and still still fluid. Yeah. So I, I, I would say yes. Is there anything that you do differently in your like life right now? In the right now in my yeah, life? Life, your career, relationships, friendships. Like what would you do differently? I'm struggling with balance. Mm. And you know this obviously because we yeah. live because <laughs> we live together. Yeah. I'm struggling with balance and it's a it's a struggle that I've identified um will be the <laughs> will be the death of me. Yeah. Uh so I think I'm constantly trying to see how I can balance things yeah. and I don't have the solution yet. I don't yeah. know how what that would look like. Uh, but if there's one thing that I think would make a difference in the life that I live, it would probably like just finding a nice balance. You know, I struggle with shutting down. I struggle yeah. with um, stillness. I was at the I was at the embassy the other day, and I was in line. Uh, you know how it is—you queue up, and yeah. you know you don't have phones and everything. And it was the most excruciating experience of my life because. You can't use your phone. You can't Ah, uh, so you're just like, yeah. I was so wasted. I started looking around. <laughs> I started reading some people's documents. That's an addiction. A lady was adjusting her file. I was like, oh, she got her admission on August, <laughs> April 24. And I was like, okay. Like, it was so awkward for me. I was like, what yeah. do I do with all this silence? I don't know how to be still mm. because I, I always tell you, I can't afford downtime. I don't yeah. know what downtime is. So my, my time is always moving. And I remember leaving the embassy. I was like, ah. That was five hours, and I looked at the phone, and it was just forty-five minutes. Yeah. And I told myself that shit. <laughs> yeah. that, that's really bad. I think for for you, mm. so let me not talk like someone that knows you personally. Well, let me just speak um, generally about work life. I hate that term, by the way. Like, what do you think about work life balance? I, I don't think it's. I think it's a myth. Yeah, it's just <laughs> not even like a myth. I just feel like it just puts unnecessary pressure. I just feel like personally, I'm just all about chasing joy. You know, and knowing when to like just hold on to those things. So me asking you like, what what do you look forward to the most in the day? And it's just like shutting up your laptop. No, like it doesn't. How would that spark joy? You know. So if you identify something that like brings you some sort of pleasure, like and then like you repetitively do it, it gives you something to yearn for. That's a lot of pressure to anticipate that kind no, of thing. No, not anticipating, but like, no, 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 like every day. But like knowing when to tap into that for me is what people see as work life balance. Mm. Knowing when, like, you've, you're depleted and you've reached your limits and you're just like, I can't do this anymore. I shouldn't even be working right now. This email, and that's the problem that you have. This email. <laughs> I feel like she's blasting me now, but no, well, tell me what no, 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 but like, this email can't wait till tomorrow. This email, if I don't send it out right now because I want to lay in bed and watch an episode of Grey's Anatomy, the person on the opposite, on the receiving end, is not going to convulse. So, <laughs> <laughs> now she's put me on full blast. No. Um, I think you're right in the sense that things can wait. Yeah. Um, I think for me, because I... Okay, I'm trying to say two things. I think there's a certain amount of pressure I have put myself on put yeah. on myself that I didn't realize that I was putting it and now to break away from it is proving you know very difficult I've always been the youngest at everything it's like youngest in this and youngest yeah. in this and you know my current position youngest to do this and do that so that comes with an extraordinary amount of pressure who put the it, pressure so that's why I was saying that I have um, I have put it on myself yeah. you know subconsciously yeah and if you look at my career trajectory in the past five years, it's been very cyclic. It's all oh, this industry today, this industry tomorrow. Yeah. So it's always meant that I'm having to learn new things every, what, 12 months, every yeah. 18 months. And that's a ridiculous amount of pressure. <laughs> I remember when I started my new job last year, I was terrified for the first three months. I was, you know, I was completely anxious. I asked myself, what have you done? Why, what are you doing in this sector? What do you yeah. know about this sector? So that comes with, okay, I have to do, I have to work twice as hard. I sound like a black woman talking about racism. <laughs> but, but, no, but the, the fact remains that that pressure of performance is there, especially yeah. if you're this person who has, who feels like you need to live up to a particular standard, who yeah. needs to feel like, oh, I want them to know that they didn't make a wrong decision in hiring yeah. such a young person to do X, Y, Z, you know? So there's that. 
and there's also another thing of me feeling um, when it comes to like email and like checking emails, responding in real time. I don't fully have an issue with it. Mm. You, mm, say what? I don't fully have an issue with it. Mm. Reason being that, <laughs> reason being that, I just feel like it's it's a quick response. Sometimes it's just the oh yes, aligned, oh approved, oh you know, great, you know. But because I know you personally, it's never just a quick response because that quick response turns into something else. It turns into there's something that you have to sort out, and it gives you sleepless nights. So what are you saying right now? No, no, no. I just, I'm just pointing out. You can, you can just, I'm just pointing it out. No, I, I, I think, yes, there's a merit in what you're saying. But I also think that sometimes I find it, so my methods of working, I, mm -hmm. I just find that it's easier to get this out of the way, yeah. meet the next thing. It's how on holiday, and I don't recommend this. A lot of people talk about this and they don't do it. But on holiday, I try to, you know, use like 30 minutes just to clean up a little bit of email <laughs> so it doesn't pile up. Uh-huh. Imagine you go, it would give me so much anxiety to come back from a week of holiday and there are 800 emails, you know. Yeah. So I'd much rather use like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just like what are the important stuff, what are the fluff, delete, delete, respond, respond, respond. Yeah. And go through it. Some people find it difficult too. Some people feel like they want to just, you know, throw their laptop away and that's fine. But what works for me is that I like to, you know, sort them out in pockets. So on the first day back at work, I'm not so overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Yeah. No, that leads me to um, <clears throat> my next question. What, what's one thing that you feel like um, being in corporate communications has taught you so far? And you've been doing this for what, like four or five years? Yeah. What has it taught me? It has taught me, um, I think, to be extremely meticulous. Mm. You know, it's, um, there's a difference between reading an email, and I use, keep using emails, but just reading any document yeah. once and reading it twice. Yeah, so do you think the meticulousness has been something that you've had over the years or you've, I don't know, it's just, it's just happened? No, I think I've been pretty meticulous for a while, yeah. you know. But I think just the level of attention I give to things no. has, you know, almost doubled. Uh -huh. um, and it's, it's because you're, you're responsible, the, 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 the weight of the responsibility is so huge yeah. that you can't afford slips. You yeah. can't afford to, you know not dot your T and dot yeah. your I's or cross your T's. So I yeah. think that's one thing that's taught me. It's also taught me um, my capabilities as well. Yeah. I think there's something about being stretched that really allows you uncover so many things that is within you. Yeah. And I always tell people when they're like, oh, you know, how are you able to do X, Y, Z? And you have to be delusional <laughs> to, to, to a certain extent. <laughs> And it doesn't just end with delusion. It also involves you being able to back that delusion up. Yeah. So there's one thing to say, oh, I can do this, and then you go and hide under your bed. Uh -huh. But there's another thing of, I can do this, and then you rise to the challenge, and you, you meet it, you know, dead in the eye, and look straight into it, and do it afraid. Yeah. So I think that's what it's also taught me, that yes, there are things you don't know. Yes, there are things that terrify you. But those things, it's, it's not enough to just back off completely. It's, yeah check how do you recover you know this year has been ridiculous with work for me but at the end of each project i end up feeling an immense sense of pride in myself because i didn't i didn't run away from it i didn't yeah. i didn't swallow it i i stood right next to it yeah what do you think about mentorship <laughs> she's put me on the spot <laughs> i think mentorship is very um i think it's very necessary uh -huh. Um, but you've also lived a life where you've not really had mental. Yeah, I was going to say. You've navigated through, like, just, it's actually quite interesting when you think about it. Okay, it's not a transition, obviously, from, like, writing to corporate communications, but I feel like when people are trying to go into something that's scary, which I know it really was for you, they kind of, like, look for people who they look up to or look for people in the industry that, you know, if they have one or two people, networks that they can connect them with and they have conversations with them or, oh, I just, I don't know, somebody to give them a pat on their back and tell yeah. them that they'll be okay. Think about it now, nah, I don't think you've yeah. really had that. Do you think that if you've had some sort of mentorship, it would, like, your path would have been different or it would, it would help you or, yeah, mm. which, what do you think about it? So I think mentorship is, I think it's important, um, but I don't think that it's the 
solution. I don't think that you yeah. have a mentor and then your life is, you know, radiant yeah. and sunny and all of that. Um, I haven't had direct or sought direct mentorship from anyone before. Um, but there are also people that I have obviously looked up, up to, to in a very kind of intimate manner. Where it's like, oh, I really like how this person is able to express it. Do you want to share some of the people that you look up to? I mean, Chimama Ndango's DJs. Yeah. Um, well, in the co corporate world. In the corporate world. I, I mean, talking about Judge Taylor, Mrs. GT, you know, I, I liked very much the fact that she was her own individual in terms of how she expresses herself and how she's able to, you know, just exist in that world. Um, but also very, very brilliant, you know, very forceful in what she wants, you know, just is the go-getter. So you, you watch these people. I, I, I think for me, I'm always very, when I meet anyone, I sort of try to I look at what I admire about them personally mm -hmm. without being so overt, like, oh, I want you to be my mentor. It's, uh, more, exactly. it's more of a private experience for yeah. me. That, oh, what do I like about this person? I yeah. like that. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. I pack that aside. How do they do that? You know, okay, they do this like pa 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 pa. Okay, and then I, I take that from there. Um, but it's something that I want to do because I feel like um, people could benefit from some kind of yeah. guidance that's, and direction. Yeah, that's what I was going to say to you because I know that you surprisingly would be a good teacher. And I feel like there are lots of people who send, I know, send you emails and like messages like, oh, they want to, you know, be in communications or how do you write so good? Like, da, da, da. Um, I feel like building a community of people who you, maybe not, maybe you need to find another word to describe it. It's like not coin it mentorship, but mm. like having a, a couple of people that you kind of like have conversations yeah. with to inspire and like just yeah. put them on the, not put them per se, but there's just something when you have a conversation with somebody who seemingly knows more than you, it gives you some sort of yeah. like, you know, comfort and like hope. No, I, I agree. Believe. I agree. And it's something that, I mean, we, I, I've, I've, I've sort of had the, the... It's in the works. It's in the works, yes. Um, for me, I also put a lot of pressure, like I've said before, I yeah. put a lot of pressure on myself on executing, you yeah. know. So it's like, if I start this, I need to see it through. I don't like yeah. to start things I, that I don't yeah. see through. Yeah. So for me, it's like, okay, what is the what is the structure of this, you know, community thing? Yeah. Because I do believe in community. I think yeah. it's very powerful. I remember my, um, so I tell everybody I've been writing since Jesus, since yeah. I was, <laughs> yeah. I was, I was no age at all. But I never considered myself a writer until I went to the Farafina workshop and yeah. community, the community of being amongst writers. And that was the only workshop. I'm not very big on, you know, workshopping all those things. Yeah. I, I'm very insular in my process. Um, so I think going to that workshop of writers and meeting people who could exchange stories, wow, it did a number on me. Yeah. So I do, I do believe in the power of community. I do believe in the power of like minds just gathering and saying, yeah. look, this is, this, is, this is what it looks like here, yeah. you know. So I do hope, yes, in the future, in the, in the close future, to be able to stare that. Yeah. Uh, the skill, I'm not quite sure yet, but, mm -hmm. you know, tiny jobs make an ocean. Yeah. What do you think? What, what, would, what comes first for you? Money or fame? Oh, what? Or fame. Oh, keep your fame. <laughs> <laughs> no. But okay. you know I don't care about fame. No, I'm just, I mean, they don't know that. Okay, so, okay, yeah. yeah. Keep your fame. I think just, it's ridiculous. No, you, you don't want to be famous? Like, it's not something... No, I don't know. I don't have never thought about being famous. Yeah. I've never... And it's very interesting to me. And you always, yeah, she always says it because <laughs> when I live in the house with the groceries, you know, she's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna wear my perfume. I'm gonna. For me, it's not <laughs> about. I just, I just was like. And I'm like. It's not about anyone. It's just a personal thing. I like to look good. Do you understand? And you don't know who you'd meet at the grocery store. And a single woman, <laughs> and a single woman living in Lagos, Nigeria, you don't oh know who you meet at the grocery store. Oh. You don't know. Who, what connections? Okay, yes, I believe yes. I believe in connections and just like meeting people and just I don't know having conversations like what we're doing now. That's the whole mm -hmm. point of unpack with name, mm -hmm. you know. So you don't know who you meet at a grocery store, so you have to look good. It's not like I'm wearing makeup or anything. It's just no, you, look, you don't. No, no. You know? I, I I'm just trying to put stress the fact that yeah. fame for me is it never comes. Yeah, it's not top of mind for me. I no, think I've always I've always done things. Um, I, I, I instead of money, I would use value. Mm. I always tell people I go where the value is at, you know. So things like and 
it's something that young people, people in their 20s should always, you know, know as well. I'm not a big fan of, um, you know, I don't know what's the word now I'm looking for. You know, people in at jobs, for example, yeah. and they are not, you know, paying them enough money yeah. or whatever. And I tell them that, what is your value? Do you know your value? And if you know your value, can you defend that value? Mm. And it's, it's, it's very transactional. I always say, in life, it's very transactional. What are you bringing to the table and what do you expect in return? Full stop. Yeah. And if you, bring, if, you, if you say, this is what I expect, X, Y, Z, because I'm going to give you A, B, C, then you better bring your A, B, C. Yeah. Otherwise, then there's an imbalance and yeah. it causes a fracture in the whole situation. Yeah. I like that because I'm just thinking about how, like, there's certain brands that I've worked with that obviously like the monetary value has not been all that. But when you think about the like quality of the yeah. brand, you're just like, okay, I'd like to align myself yeah, with this go brand. Go where the value is. Yeah. Go where the value is. So for me, it's... So, yeah, money is part of value. And money is a measure of value. So that's why for me, it's more preferred yeah. compared to fame. fame. I think fame is very terrifying. Yeah. I remember what was this... I think maybe 2016. Do you yeah, remember actually, very the, awkward when people like when we're out and people walk up to you, and be like, Oh my god, I love you so much. I read you, like, I'm reading, I've been written, I've been read, and then I whatever. introduce myself. And he's like, Hi, that's you. <laughs> it's like, Well, they know you, <laughs> that's why they're walking up to you. He's so awkward. No, but remember, I think for me, my first experience, I sound like a anyway, but my first experience of the downside to fame, I think it was 2016. I don't know if you remember when yeah. there was someone on Instagram who was stealing my work. Ah, uh, yeah. 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 Down yeah. to what I wrote about our mother. Yeah. And he, I think for me it was like, first of all, at that point, I don't know how many followers I yeah. had or, you know, I don't know where I had published at that time, but I was considerably a nobody. Yeah. But someone had thought it was okay to just plagiarize my work from start to, to finish, yeah. finish. And I found that such, I thought that kind of... Um, invasion of privacy was so violent for me and I really, really struggled with that. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, do you think that you can just have access to these things simply because, yeah. you know? So I think that was very ugly for me and it really has shaped largely how I interact with the concept of fame. Yeah. Um, tell us about like your first, um, is it composition? Like, like your first writing experience. Like when was the first time you wrote something and you were just like, to be a writer like this is what i was made to do um the first time so i may have two responses to that i think the first response i think was when daddy turned i think it was 40. So 20 years ago so you were like oh, yeah. how does how oh my wow. goodness yes okay yeah so 20 how old is daddy 21, 21 yeah 21 years ago yeah mm -hmm. i remember we had gotten a, a card for him Okay. And because we were four, so each of us were supposed to write on each corner of the card. Okay. So when you open the card, right? And then Kemi had written, Happy birthday, Dad, you're the best. And then Norma had written, like, Happy birthday, Dad, I love you. And you're writing, Oh, happy birthday, Dad, whatever. And I started from my own. I <laughs> touched your own entered. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember just that experience of it. I remember registering when I was done. Looking at it, I'm like, oh, there's something a bit odd about this whole situation yeah. right now. Because you finished why? it over here. And I think for me, it was my first experience of expressing true language. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, why did I not just say happy birthday, daddy? Yeah, so why didn't you just... Because I, I think for me, it was very... You had um, more words. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. very... It was... It didn't feel... I didn't feel exhausted of what I wanted to say. Mm. And I think for me, that's what writing is largely around. It's like, yeah. if I want to say something, I'm going to exhaust myself. I'm going to use language to exhaust myself of yeah. a particular feeling. Yeah. So I'm feeling at this point grateful for this man who is my father, feeling like an adoration towards him and all of that. So it didn't feel, I didn't feel justified mm. that happy birthday was enough. Yeah. So that's one experience. Um, second experience, I, I, I don't know. I think maybe I'll bring it down to maybe getting into the Farafina workshop as well. Okay, yeah. I think... I remember that. <laughs> yeah, I think I had applied to the workshop the year before, mm -hmm. but I didn't get in and I didn't take anything of it. And the next year, I did try it again and I got in. <laughs> and I remember just freaking out because I was like, what, what is here, what is here, what is here? 
And then I go on and, you know, it's brilliant writers from across the world. Bassi came from, from yeah. New York. And I had written something. I think Mama just passed, I think, the year before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went, she passed 2013. I went um, 2014, mm -hmm. August. So I think it was one year into her passing. And I had written something that was just very, um, which many people would call it very flowery. Uh, and I liked it. It didn't make so much sense uh, to a lot of people. And I remember it, uh, to my mind, I would say, you know, your grandmother is a basket in the sun, uh, because that was my opening line. Yeah, that was, that was, our, first, <laughs> that was our first conversation with you. And that was, my, that was my opening line, because for me, it was the ability to express that. I understood what it meant, mm -hmm. even though not many people would understand that. And I liked it. I liked it very much. Yeah. I liked it very much. Grandma is a basket in the sun. How would you like? Well, even I, we had the same grandma, but I wouldn't even describe her that way. What was that about? So I think when I remember the emotions, because I, I writing is an extension of an emotion, mm -hmm. right? So I remember the emotion I was feeling in thinking about the subject of Mama, right? And I was like, obviously she's a fierce, you know, yeah. strong, you know, one of those women that people actually don't like. <laughs> I always tell her that our governor was not like it, but she didn't care about being like, yeah. you know. And I thought about how, if you think about how they weave baskets, mm -hmm. you know, they weave it in the sun. And, oh, just think about someone weaving a basket in the sun. It's scotchy, it's largely uncomfortable, but there's a lot of focus on just weaving this basket to the point where yeah. it's fully formed yeah. and it's strong and formidable. Yeah. So I think for me, that was the thing that I was just trying to express, that this is a tough woman who, yes, you know, maybe the person that was weaving was, like, annoyed or irritated or I whatever, like but he... I think that's so interesting. Um, obviously, we've, we've experienced a lot of loss in our family, you know. Well, not a lot, but, like, some significant loss. <laughs> Why are you? Why are you? <laughs> some significant loss, and I think that... Out of all of us, you are the one person who maybe is the gift, gift or a curse. You know, you have you have strong memories of everything. Even this description of baskets in the sun, like I just, I've actually never asked you about it. <laughs> I just, I read everything you write, and I'm just like, oh, very nice. Um, but yeah, out of the four of us, I feel like you're the one person who holds on to loss so deeply you remember it you tell stories about it mm. um be it from my mother be it from our grandparents like it's just been mm. that sense of i don't know how to describe it how do you think that the losses that we've experienced that you hold on so dearly to you and i don't know you just recount them so like how do you think it's shaped you yeah so far i think for me grieve as a subject and loss I, I think those are two emotions i'm most interested oh. about yeah i'm um, interested in curious about i think they're very formative mm -hmm. i think how we how we emerge from a loss is really what defines us yeah and if you think about all the losses that we've incurred in our family they've really shaped they've really shaped us mm -hmm. so for me it's it's also a way of honoring the experience of you know, not just losing, but the attachment to, you know, the loss. Yeah. I'll tell you this. I remember, I haven't said this before, but I'll tell you. I remember um, freaking out the year I was turning 28. Have we had this conversation before? No, I'm not sure. So, um, you know, my mom passed at 28. So that's a very, very young age for anyone to die. Yeah. And I think before you get to 28, you, you think that it's so, I mean. I think we've had that conversation because that's like, that's one of my biggest fears too. I feel like I've, I've sorry to cut you. I'll just yeah. listen to you. And no, then I, I had, I, I had yeah. it. It was very real for me. I was wow. like, shit, 28, I'm going to turn 28. Yeah. And what does that look like? Yeah. And all of that. And it, I felt like it crept up on me. Mm -hmm. I felt like I, I didn't like plan and anticipate turning 28. And then the year I was turning 28, I was just like, wow, 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 wow. And before that, I would think about like our mom's passing. I would think about it as something that was done to us. Yeah. You know, it's like it felt very unfair it and all of that. Yeah. It was a great disservice to us. But I remember turning 28 and just realizing that, fuck, it's such a huge disservice to her because yeah. 
Like, no one wants to go at 28. No one wants to. Like, 28, there's still countries you want to travel yeah. to. There's still things that you want to, you know, experience. And that really, like, turned me around mm. in a very deep way because I was just like, I'm so sorry that you had to, you had to go, you know. I, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't about me anymore. It was more about her and, you know, all the things that she you know, had maybe had wanted all the places she had wanted to go to, yeah. the lives that she was not yet able to leave. So I think being intimate with loss and being intimate with grief, I think it allows me to really take stock yeah. of what I'm feeling, how to live in the moment, how to appreciate life, how to also not forget. Yeah. Because you've mentioned about memory. I think memory is one of our most, one of my most cherished um, I love memories. It's yeah. for me. It's how I, I I take them in pictures. I take them in uh, so, in voice notes. And you, then, I, I want to say something with the memories thing. I think we all, maybe just me and you, anyway. Um, do you know why? Do, do, you, do you have an idea why you like to like memories so much? Yeah, because I feel like I'm not, and it's not a good thing. I feel like sometimes I don't live in the moment. Mm. I don't think I know how to live in the moment. And it's almost like my ability to capture memories is, is, is because I want to also go back mm. to like relive it because I did not leave it yeah. when it was happening. You yeah. know, so it's always like because I, I can't just be in the moment. I'm like, okay, I have to take this, preserve this, and then go back, you know, and then look through it and feel everything, yeah. you know. So, um, yeah. For me, when it comes to memories, thinking about it, I just feel like, we don't have a lot of pictures of our mother. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I so, yeah. yeah. So when I'm with um, my friends or like people that I care about, obviously like I'm present, but I want to, I want to have pictures. Yeah, no, but <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's true. And yeah. it's true. And even like pictures from childhood as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. You know? I don't know what I look like as a, as a baby. <laughs> I don't have any baby pictures. She was very beautiful. I, uh, like I, the first picture I have, Oh my, do you know how crazy I think? Yeah, do you know how crazy I am? First picture I have, the only picture you have of me as a child is a picture of four of us. I don't know what I look like. You're wearing like a, you're wearing like a powder. You're wearing yeah, like a, like a powder, blue, like a blue, baby, yeah. like blue. That's the only picture. I was like six or five years old. I don't have any pictures yeah, from z from one to zero or whatever the guy or the counts. I'm the sure thing. you do. We just I, we don't have them. I've never seen them. I don't know how cute I was as a child. <laughs> I don't know if I had chubby cheeks. I don't know if I was skinny. I have oh my nothing. Goodness. Um, so I, maybe this is even why, like, I like there's a there's a passion for like you know creativity and documenting and just like creating yeah. because large like a large part of me can't believe that I don't know what I looked like as a child. What? So whatever, like, however it is I look right now, I want to know it. Yeah. Like, I want to look back when I'm 60 and be like, oh, this is how you looked at 20. Yeah. This is how yeah. you looked at 22. We have, we have the same experience of yeah. that as well. And that's why for me... That's something I just want to now because I don't think I've actually, it. like, yeah. Yes. I yes. don't think I've actually said it out loud. Like, that's why I take, like, pictures yeah. and I create. And I, oh, I like it. I like it so much. The ability to, like, document and tell a story. Yeah. And just Because we, we exist in pockets of stories. So yeah. this is a story now. Yeah. What we're having for lunch is a story. Yeah. Driving home is a story as well. Yeah. And so just having all of this as a, as a human experience, I think yeah. it's, it's really beautiful. And I like it. I, yeah. I always I always would want to do that. Yeah, I was like, I've, I've loved this conversation. Very, very interesting conversation. What do you think about it? Uh, that's good. Given the fact that I didn't know what you wanted to talk to me about. Yeah. But, uh, I just have one more question for you. This one, last question. Tell me. When are we getting the book? The book? Hmm. You know I will write a book. Yeah, this is like when? You know, you know I will publish a book. Yeah, I don't know. And time is just a construct. <laughs> Anything about writers and people who use big words, you, you just try to be evasive. No, 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 no. I, I have a... I know I write a book. Of course you, you know, know that you write a book. So for me, it's, it's to give myself time is to put pressure on myself. And I already have a lot of pressure that I put on myself. But I do know that it's coming. But one thing I wanted to say as well is about this conversation that we mm -hmm. just had is it's really helped me um, just look at the things that I 
want to work on with myself. This conversation? Yeah. We love that. Uh, you know, you know, and I think it's it's uh it's part of why you wanted to do this, that yeah. people can experience or engage with it and think that oh there's something here that I want to tweak and something here that yeah. I want to change. I always tell people that it's so funny that this whole concept of emotional intelligence, vulnerability, it's so difficult. And it's difficult not because um, people don't want to. Yeah. It's because we just never have the tools for it. Yeah. You know, if you think about any vocation, if you think about mathematics, if you think about fi uh, finance, if you think about language, if you think about handwriting, mm. we learned all these things yeah. in school. You learn how to write. I remember learning how to write. You learn how to calculate. But there's no, there's no direct part that teaches you about how can you be an emotionally um, intelligent human being? How can yeah. you check in with yourself to know the pulse of this is, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that, or okay, maybe I don't want to do that. And it's very difficult. And people, rather than engaging with it, just close from it because where do you even start from? Exactly. You are 20 years old, 30 years old, you've lived your life fully fledged, you, learn how, you know how to speak five different languages that you learned, you know how to do the Y, the X, yeah. but they you're know. somehow expected to know how to, you know, just move things around in your psyche and say, okay, I'm not going to freak out about this. I'm going to, it's difficult. Yeah. It's, and that's why everyone is, is dealing with it because yeah. there's no, no one teaches no you tools. about it. There are no yeah. tools for it. So maybe in having these conversations, maybe in pockets of, um, you know, engagements here and there, yeah. people can realize that, you know, that's, that's really, you know? that's really my goal. That's yeah. really like what's, you know, what yeah. I yearn for. I'm sorry. I, I, saw, I saw the last question was the last question, but, this is the final question. Um, if someone were to write a book about the life that you've lived so far, what do you think one? What do you think would be a word? A word to describe the book or the life that you've lived so far? Because you've had, you've had a life. I've lived. I've you've lived, lived. I've lived. But such um, a young, such a young man. <laughs> we're not. We're not embarrassed. You're not not embarrassed. But we won't tell. Uh, I've lived. What would be the word? Um. I think I've just always not liked the concept. A word. <laughs> no, but it's no. You can't do that to just me. Just one word. Oh my goodness. So I can't give you a context. One word first, and then I will approve the context. Okay. Okay. One word. Uh, I'm torn between. Okay. 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 One word. Resilience. Huh? Resilience. Resilience. Okay. But that sounds very cold. But no, what I'm trying to say, so. what I'm trying okay, to say, give is, us more context. what I'm trying to say more is the ability to. I don't like to be one thing, and it's something that I I think I've always just known from a young age. Where yeah. it's like, I don't like anyone's perspective of me to be the only thing. Mm, you know, like it's that. like. Know how they say put confusion in their midst. Mm. This I, I, mm -hmm. I sort of like that because for me the idea that. We're supposed to just be monotonous creatures. It's, it's just really ridiculous. Yeah. So this concept of, oh, yeah, you're a writer, so therefore you shouldn't do this, or yeah. you're this, so you shouldn't do that. I, I think we like just limit humility. ourselves. So you can wake up now tomorrow and decide to be a rapper? No, not that extreme. I think to be a footballer. Not that extreme. Fluidity. <laughs> not, that, not that extreme, but I just, I just, it's just something that... You, you you allow yourself the opportunity to try things, uh. and if you fail at it, you fail at it. Yeah. You know. Oh God, I just want to keep talking. With like one one more question, when was the last time you felt like a failure? Like not failure, but when was the last time you felt like you failed at something? Because you know the one thing about you is like you try, like you don't want to be put in a box, so you try and you never give up. When is the one time that you felt like I can't do this or I failed? There's no coming out of this. Do you think I have felt that recently? Am I in your mind? I don't think so. You don't think so? That's really good. Okay. I don't think so. I'm trying to think because I don't want to be dishonest. But yeah. I, I, like me, I have like small meltdowns where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I feel about this. And then yeah. I talk to someone and they're like, come on, don't be silly. You know, but I don't think there's anything with jam. that graphitis. Jam? I never failed jam. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's true. I feel jam. <laughs> I just have a feeling that like, it's oh, true. maybe, maybe. Yeah, but that was not my work. Yeah, I, I got a D seven in my work okay. for mathematics. Well, that's, 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 that's exactly. Different. So that's because yeah, education, I remember, education is a different, no, no, but I different conversation. I, I remember when I failed. When, when I, did I, is that fail? I think that's fail. 
And then I told daddy, and daddy was like, I mean, we all expected you to be on mathematics. Because <laughs> you didn't like mathematics. I'll be surprised if you came English. here with an A1. And it really made me feel better because, yeah, <laughs> what if I came back with an A1 Way in to mathematics? Go. Yeah. That's good parenting. Yeah, it's good parenting. He <laughs> was like, oh, stop crying. We all expected this. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good parenting. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, maybe that. Maybe that. I think yeah, that's that fine. Uh, okay, we're done. Like, last, this is not a question. We're just like signature. Let's like unpack, unpack with Nate question. Um, tell me three things that you're grateful for right now in this season in your life, of your life. So, so I'm grateful for access. Mm -hmm. uh, the access that I have to have impact on so many levels, on a personal level, on a professional level. Because I don't take that for granted, you know. Mm -hmm. Anytime someone reaches out to me personally to say, "Oh, something you wrote made me feel less alone," or like you know, that. so that's access, you know. And then on the work side, you know, demonstrating impact in you know the place that I work. Oh, we haven't thought about doing this like this until you joined the team. We hadn't. So I like. I, I'm grateful for that. Of course, I'm grateful for you know family, friends, you know the people that I love. Um, I used to think that I was an easy person, but I realized that I'm quite difficult. <coughs> <laughs> so I'm very grateful for uh, I'm very grateful for people who tolerate me, the people who are in my close circle. Um, I'm grateful for for the spirit of boldness. Mm. I think, and I have this whole anecdote that I say about oh, uh, Obago or how you know Daddy calls me Obago, and it always means that you're a lion killer, you're very fearless and you're bold and all of that. And there's something to be said about that, of course, but I think just the ability to be bold, to know what you want and go after it, that discernment, yeah. I think I'm grateful for it. Oh, I love that. Love that, love that, love that. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Um, obviously, I love you so much, you're my brother, but I think that the world needs, the world needs to see like, just your greatness and all of that. You're so young. Well, like I genuinely believe that you know there's so much more greatness ahead, Thank and you. I cannot wait to just you know keep being front row to the success that you're going to be. So. Thank you for coming on my show. Thank you. Am I going to get a, a signature hug? Yes, a signature. I'm back with me. I love you. I love you too. Yeah.